Deuteronomy chapter 6 contains one of, if not the most important commandment in all of Judaism. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. When Jesus was asked what is the greatest commandment, that's the one he quoted. And to this day, traditional Jews are expected to recite this commandment every single day. But as important as this commandment is for both Jews and Christians, it isn't without its difficulties. As I mentioned in the first session, for instance, there there are questions about what it is actually requiring. What does it mean to love God? And how can such a thing be commanded in the first place? For as the Jewish scholar John Levinson asks, for how can an emotion be commanded? How can we be required to generate a feeling within ourselves? One way of resolving the difficulty, as I mentioned before, is to recognize that within the context of Deuteronomy, loving God is not simply a matter of feelings or emotions, but but rather of loyalty and obedience. Just as Moses here commands the Israelites to love the Lord with all their heart and soul, so in chapter 10, he tells them to serve the Lord with all their heart and soul and to obey his commandments. So you might say this commandment isn't demanding us to to drum up feelings. It's requiring us to serve and obey the Lord. That's one way to resolve the question, but it doesn't entirely solve it. Because even if when Moses commands us to love, even if he means something like obey, that's not all he means. There's still a reason that he uses the word love. As another Old Testament scholar, Christopher Wright, points out, even if love and obey are nearly synonymous in Deuteronomy, that doesn't mean they're interchangeable in their meaning. Love, Wright says, clearly has a distinctive range of affective meaning, not entirely equivalent to the practical sense of obey. Love may not be merely a feeling, but it certainly isn't without feeling. So this command that Moses gives and Jesus repeats and and Jews daily recite, it asks for our loyalty and our obedience, and it asks that they come from the heart. What's more, it asks that this love consume our entire being, our heart and soul and might, everything that we are. As St. Augustine said, how much with the whole? The whole what? I mean, not the whole ear and nose and hand and foot, with the whole heart, with the whole soul, with the whole mind, with the whole of what is alive in you, you shall love the fountain of life. Obviously, this command is no small matter. It's asking us not something minimal, but our entire being. But why? On what basis does God demand this of his people? Why should we be expected to give him such affection? Why should we be required to devote so much of who we are to his service? Why should we love the Lord? That may seem like an odd or maybe even pretentious thing to ask of Moses. I mean, you might think that Moses would just expect it to be obvious to the Israelites, that he would balk at such a question. But actually, if you read Deuteronomy chapters 5 through 9, you'll notice that Moses actually does provide an answer to that question. He doesn't just command our total and entire loyalty and love. He tells us why we ought to give it. Notice, for instance, how he begins his recitation of the Ten Commandments in chapter 5. First, he reminds the people of where they received those commandments and why. The Lord, our God, made a covenant with us in Horeb. In other words, Moses is saying, remember the history of these commandments. This isn't just some powerful deity insisting you recognize his authority. This is the one who entered into relationship, into a covenant with you at Sinai. And then to further emphasize the point, notice how he begins his recitation of the commandments themselves. 
I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. That's how he begins the Ten Commandments. It's actually how they begin in Exodus chapter 19 as well, with the sentence, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Now, many Christians don't realize that because we rarely include that statement when we recite the Ten Commandments. We just begin with the first prohibition, thou shalt have no other gods before me. But when Jews recite the Ten Commandments, they, they typically begin with this statement by God. And it's important that we as Christians remember that it's there because it changes how you think about the commands. If you think the Ten Commandments begin with a prohibition, thou shalt have no other gods, then you might be tempted to conclude that these are just a bunch of rules handed down from some authority on high. But if you begin with the words Moses does, I am the Lord your God, then you'll realize they're not just the arbitrary wishes or rules of a higher power. These are instructions given by the one who loved his people so much that he liberated them from captivity. They're not just a set of rules. They are the guidelines of your liberator and your redeemer, of the one who loves you and rescued you. That's how Moses tells them. And that is why he's saying you should follow them. That's Moses' basic argument, and it's one he repeats multiple times over in chapters 7 through 9. In chapter 7, for instance, he says, The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession, out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. In other words, this, this God, the Lord, Yahweh, he's not just the one who rescued you from Egypt. He's the one that chose you to be his people. Of all the nations, of all the peoples in the earth, he chose you. And why? Why did he choose you? Well, it's not because you were great or impressive. It was not, Moses says, because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples. Israel wasn't some, some mighty or impressive nation. Nor, Moses says in chapter 9, nor were they more righteous or more just than the nations around them. Remember, Moses says, and do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day you came out of the land of Egypt until you came to this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. When you read these statements that Moses makes, you may wonder why he seems to have a such a strong desire to insult his audience. Well, why tell the Israelites that they're unimpressive and, and frankly immoral? What's the point in beating them up like that? But Moses, he's not trying to beat them up, nor is he trying to insult them. What he's doing is reminding them that they are the unworthy recipients of divine love, that they have been have been lavished with attention and affection that they did nothing to deserve. And it is of vital importance that they remember that because if they forget, then they will forget why they ought to love God with all their heart and soul and might. And this is not just true of ancient Israel. In his book, The Four Loves, C.S. Lewis talks about how we as individuals, how we too have a remarkable capacity to do exactly what Moses warns those ancient Israelites against, to, to delude ourselves into believing that, that somehow we have earned or deserved our position as God's people. No sooner, Lewis says, do we believe that God loves us than there is an impulse to believe that he does so, not because he is love, but because we are intrinsically lovable. And when we do that, when we forget the lesson of De Deuteronomy, Lewis observes, when we allow ourselves to believe that God loves us because we're intrinsically lovable, then we lose our very reason for loving God. Because in order to love God, Lewis says, in order to love God, we must first recognize 
our desperate need for him, our dependence on him. In order to love God, we require a full, childlike, and delighted acceptance of our need, a joy and total dependence. We become jolly beggars. As I read Deuteronomy and reflect on its command to love the Lord, I think Moses' answer to the question of why, why love the Lord with heart and soul and might, I think it's remarkably similar to what C.S. Lewis has to say about our need for and our dependence on God. What Moses was trying to teach the Israelites with the way he begins the Ten Commandments and, and with his many comments in chapters 7 through 9, what he's trying to teach them is to embrace their need with a full childlike and delighted acceptance, to joyfully recognize their total dependence, to become, as Lewis said, jolly beggars. Because jolly beggars know why they ought to love the Lord. For them, it's not even a question. But even if we accept that, even if we can recognize and accept the, the why of this command, we're still left with the question of how. How can we love the Lord? One answer, and without question, the most theologically appropriate answer, is the one that Lewis himself gives in The Four Loves. The love that Moses commands is not something we can generate in ourselves. We can't fulfill this command simply by strength of will or by some kind of strategy that we may devise. God alone can enable us to obey this command to love. It is the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 5. It is the Holy Spirit who sheds forth love abroad in our hearts. Which is why, as St. Augustine said, it's why we must learn to ask God himself, grant me the grace to do what you command. That being said, the Bible makes it clear that God often uses very practical means to grant this grace, to communicate this gift of being able to love him. And in this section of Deuteronomy, it's, it's clear that one of the practical ways that God enables the people of Israel to do what he commands, one of the ways he assists them to love him with all their heart and soul is by teaching them how to remember. Uh, remembering memory is immensely important for Moses. Because, as he repeatedly emphasizes in these chapters, because the greatest danger that the Israelites will face is their own tendency to forget. Take care, Moses says, lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes. And then again, he warns, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. The danger facing Israel in their new homeland, the error into which they'll be tempted to give in when all of this prosperity arrives. The danger, Moses warns, is the danger of forgetting. They will forget their need. They will forget the Lord. And in forgetting, they will stop loving him and they will stop obeying his commands. Therefore, in order to love the Lord, they must first remember. But Moses doesn't just tell them to remember. He also gives them specific habits and practices by which they may remember. Take, for instance, what he tells them in chapter 6, right after he gives the command to love the Lord. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house. The intention to remember is all well and good. It's great to, in, to want to remember, Moses is saying. But in order to do that, in order to not fall into the trap of forgetting, you've got to develop actual practices that help you remember. As Stephen Fowle puts it, forgetting the Lord involves more than a failure of memory. 
It is also tied to a failure to practice the right forms of attentiveness and to keep those practices of attentiveness rooted in catechesis. In other words, what, what causes Israel to forget and therefore to abandon this first and most important commandment to love God, what causes them to forget doesn't just come from forgetfulness. It comes from not continuing these very practical habits of remembering and these practices of reminding their children. The reason that they don't love the Lord is that they have forgotten him. And the reason that they forget him is because they stop making it a daily habit to, to practice these rituals of remembering and telling the story. So to recap, Moses tells the Israelites, and Jesus tells us, that the first and primary command is to love the Lord with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind. And that the reason we should love him is because we owe him everything, because we are jolly beggars. And that the way to love him is through these habits and practices that will remind us, whatever we're inclined to forget, that will remind us just how infinitely indebted to him we really are.